I gotta tell you a story, one that I'm not too proud of. A few years ago, uh, I was at the grocery store, not the grocery store actually, just a, a store, I won't mention the name of the store, uh, become clear why in a moment. But anyways, I, uh, I had bought something and I wanted to return it. And so I, uh, I go to the return desk and it was something I had not even opened, I definitely hadn't used. I literally like got home, I'm like, oh, this part won't fit, it's the wrong one, wrong make. And so I literally just put it in my car the next time I was in the neighborhood, went to drop it off. And uh, if you ever wanna feel good about the cleanliness and, and you know, or disorder of your home, maybe that's a better word, if you ever wanna feel good about the disorder in your home, look behind the desk of the return bin, right? Like when you drop off returns, it's just like stuff piled and strewn. And as I showed up here, it was no different. In fact, there was a table even just out front, like they were out of room on the shelves for all the returns. And so there was all this stuff. And unlike my package that was neatly, you know, still together, there were things I was like, I'm like, I'm pretty sure someone like got that for prom and then returned it. And someone got a power tool, used it and returned it. Like, you know, they had one job to do. And I'm like, I'm just bringing back, like, this is going to be a dream. Like I'm making this person's job so easy. So I have my receipt. I have my credit card. I have the item. And I asked them to return it. And they're like, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, we can't receive this item. And I said, why? And they're like, well, it's a 30 day return policy. I'm like, yeah. They're like, this is day 31. What? But you'll take back the used prom dress? Like, are you kidding me? And so anyways, it's just, and I'm like, well, you know, it's, come on, come on. It was just, and I bought it at night and it's now morning. So it's really only 30 and a half days. Let's round down. Come on, come on, right? And they're like, no, no, sir. No, sir. And so, I, you know, just back and forth, back and forth. And then I was like, I just, I just gotta be honest. Like something started to come up inside of me and I just started to shake a little bit. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what came over me, but I grabbed the table with all the returns on it and I threw it and I threw all the items off of it. And then I took my belt off and I started waving it around. And then all of a sudden someone tapped me on the shoulder and they're like, hey, aren't you the pastor at Lakeside? I made that whole story up. Just, some of you, whoa! Some of you were like, I knew he was an ax murderer. And others of you are like, he always seemed so nice. What is going on? And then I'm probably on Monday gonna get an email from someone who were like, I heard what you did at the store and I just turned it off. I'm so appalled. And I'm like, no, no, I didn't. I made it up. But anyways, the interesting thing about today is today we encounter a Jesus who I think kind of did that. Or it appears he did that. Except at the end, it doesn't say, ah, oh, nightmare, or ah, oh, it was a dream, or ah, oh, I made that story up. It's like, nope. That happened. That happened or something like that happened. And part of me, like that just clashes with my idea of who Jesus is, which is loving and peaceful and kind. And all of a sudden I see rage and anger and violence and destruction of property. And I'm trying to make sense. I'm trying to understand, but it's clashing with my idea of what Jesus as king is like. And if you've ever wondered about that, if you've ever wrestled with that, today's the perfect day as we journey through that story and try and make sense of a Jesus who's clashing with the perfect picture of Jesus that we have in our heads. And so as we jump into it, there's actually four different accounts of this story that we're gonna dig into in the scriptures. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every one of them has an account of Jesus walking into a temple and what appears to be flipping tables, okay? And so we're gonna go into that today. We're gonna go to the book of Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. I'd love for you to join us in that as we go through it. We're just gonna kind of read the passage together. Matthew 21, 12. It should be coming up on your screen in a moment. We'll just give you a minute to find it in your passage as we find the slides. There it is. Perfect. So Matthew 21. Jesus entered the temple courts. And he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And then he said, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, Historically, this story has been used to justify all kinds of different things. There are times when people have used this story, well, Jesus flipped some tables to justify their tempers, their rage, their violence, riots, destruction of property. And today we're gonna jump into this story. If you're not a church person, you're not a Christian, you're like, oh, dang, like I didn't expect this. Like I've always heard great things about Jesus. My friend invited me. They told me you're gonna be blown away by this person, Jesus. We're going through this series. We're just looking at Jesus. You're gonna love Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus and is like, so what's happening in this story where Jesus, you know, a lot of times has been seen as having a temper tantrum? What's going on? Well, let me give you some context. That's important to understand what exactly he's walked into because last I checked, most of us haven't been to a temple before or in recent history. 
So the first thing is there was the temple, which was in Jerusalem, and devout Jews would come every year, sometimes twice a year, to offer sacrifices. And they would travel a long way, and they would actually not be able, in the same way that when you have money and you go on a trip, you have to exchange your money for what's valuable in that country. So they needed to have the temple shekel. They couldn't use their other currency. So when they showed up, they already had a problem because they wanted to sacrifice animals, but they didn't want to bring the animals with them on a journey. Some of you were like, bringing my children and my pet is enough. Imagine having a goat in the back seat, right? It's like, it's a lot to bring along with you. And so like all of a sudden, they're there to make their sacrifices. It's what pious Jews did. It was a way of, of uh, a part of their worship. And they show up and then Jesus says, and in the temple, he starts, he starts calling this out. And he's like, it was a den of thieves. Like what's happening here? Well, some people saw this as a business opportunity. It's like all these people coming to worship God, doing this great thing. It's like, but they need to exchange their money. So we'll exchange their money, but we'll charge them a premium. So we'll, we're gonna take some money off the top. And then the second stage of the exploitation was then our friends down the line, they're selling animals and they're hiking up the price too. So not only did you not get enough money back for your currency exchange, but now you're paying with the little money that you have more than those animals were worth. It's kind of like trying to get a hot dog at the Rogers Center, right? It's like, what, $12, right? It's like that, except in the religious sphere. And so Jesus is like looking at this and he calls this a den of thieves. And a den of thieves was literally like a cave off in the backwoods where the robbers would hide their ill-gotten bounty and plan for their next criminal act. And Jesus calls this out and he's like, there's like an organized crime syndicate hanging out right here in the temple. And so Jesus is not happy and he calls it out and he's like, you guys are just a bunch of thieves. And so as this is going on, it's not just happening in the temple, it's happening in a very specific place, in a place called the court of the Gentiles. So this is interesting. In the temple, there was racial segregation. There was a place you could go as a Jew, and the non-Jews weren't allowed to go there. They had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. Not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So there's racial segregation. If you read later on in the stories of Jesus, Jesus actually destroys the barrier of hostility. That's what it was called, the racial segregation. Jesus is not for racial segregation, and he destroys that in the future. But right now, there are people who are already marginalized, people who aren't allowed to get closer to God, but they have their court, and in in this court, there are people that have organized all this elaborate system of crimes to take place, to take money from these people. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. This was meant as a place for prayer, a place for encountering God, and you have made it a place to exploit people and take their money. You've made it a marketplace. And so Jesus is having none of it. So when he shows up and he sees that, he's not too impressed, okay? Now, some of you are like, okay, that makes sense. Now, the, question, the tactic is questionable, and we'll get to what Jesus did in a moment, but it's clear this is the bottom line what Jesus is doing. We can all agree on this. He's going after exploitive business practices and making it difficult for people to encounter God. Jesus is going after business practices that exploit the marginalized and people who make it difficult to encounter God. Okay, now before we get into the application of what's going on here, can we just talk about some of the bad application that sometimes happens with this text? Because sometimes it's more important to go after the bad application than the good application. Okay, many times this text, as I said earlier, has been used to justify rage, verbal abuse, violence, rioting, destruction of property in Jesus' name right? We've all been on Facebook and we've all seen someone say something. They like verbally abuse someone in Jesus' name. And then they kind of give this apology or what I call a non-apology, which is like, sorry for my tone, but you know, sometimes Jesus flips some tables too. And it's like, hmm. Now I'm going to say that's bad application. I'm going to say that doesn't fit the story. That fits Hollywood and ancient art. Because when you look in history, in fact, all you need to do is Google it, and you can find ancient art of Jesus with a whip and people like terrified and getting hit. And all of a sudden, it's like Jesus is raging mad. Hollywood, Warner Brothers made a movie, the Jesus film. Many of you have seen it. Wonderful film. But I got to say, I think they got this scene wrong, okay? This scene, I call this scene Kung Fu Jesus, okay? It's literally like Jesus shows up, peaceful Jesus, shows up at the temple, and then all of a sudden, it's like zeroed in on his eyes, and then all of a sudden, it's like showing like the people selling and buying and exploiting and all this stuff, and it's like, doof, 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 and just zooms in, zooms in, zooms in, and there's a gong. I'm like, what's a gong doing in ancient Rome, right? And then he goes all like, crouching tiger, hidden dragon, and he just loses it, right? And he's like, ah! And it's just like explosive Jesus. He's like, he has a whip in his hand and he's kicking things over and flipping things and destroying property and scaring people and everyone's terrified. And that's how it goes. And I'm like, that's interesting because when you read all four accounts, you don't find that, not even a hint of that. You will not find one place in any of the accounts where Jesus yells, where he raises his voice, where he lays a hand on anyone. 
you will not find any point where he is out of control. You will not even find impulse. In fact, in the book of John, it says when he saw this, he braided a cord, a whip. He actually took time to get ready for what he was about to do. And before you're like, and he had a whip. It's like, and what did he do with the whip? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but he didn't hit anybody with it. It was calculated. Jesus did not violate his values for peace, love, charity, and nonviolence. Bottom line, you will not find rage, yelling, or violence in this story if you read it from scripture. Hollywood and ancient art, maybe. Second thing. Well, what about rioting and destruction of property? I don't know if you've uh, seen the memes lately, especially with what's going on in the world, which simply have this tongue-in-cheek statement that says, who said destruction of property wasn't the Jesus way? Now, before I speak to that, before I tackle that, I want to be really clear on some things. This has come to our attention recently in all that's been going on in the world with Black Lives Matter protests. And it's not the first time where this question has come up or statements like this have been made. In fact, all throughout history, this event has been used to justify violence, destruction of property, um, protests that take on that sort of form and all, all types of things. And so let's just, let's just be clear, okay? In the last few months, we have seen more speak, speaking out and more protests than any other time in history that were all united on one front, which was racism. We've seen that. At the same time, paralleled to that, we have also in the news watched riots destruction of property, vandalism, looting, and violence. Now, some people, when they saw all this happened, they ignored everything. They painted it with a broad brush stroke and you just kind of brush it off. Like, ah, all of it, it's just all political. It's all just, you know, it's criminal. It's just a distraction to keep us away from what's really going on. They just wrote, you just wrote off the whole thing, one big broad brush stroke. I need to say this to you today. Broad brush strokes are for lazy Jesus followers. Broad brush strokes are for lazy Jesus followers. Jesus had the ability. He did not just write things off and movements off. He stepped into situations and had the ability to call out the evil and the beauty at the same time. He didn't use broad brush strokes. He got into the mess. He got into the gray of life. I think of the story that Robin's gonna teach us next week of the woman caught in adultery. He doesn't just wipe that whole thing up. Well, you're all kind of screwed up. So all you're in, just go ahead, do what you're gonna do. Right, no, no, no. What does Jesus do? He steps into the situation. He calls out the religious leaders who have pulled this woman out of a, an adulterous relationship. And they're like, how dare you, you hypocrites, is basically what he says. How dare you? And then at the same time, you know, turns this woman who he's just rescued and just called out religious hypocrites for their evil. And he says, and also, knock it off. Like, what are you doing? Right, like Jesus is able to get into the nitty gritty and see the beauty and the darkness at the same time and deal with both. He doesn't just brush it over with a broad stroke. And in the same way, have there in the news been riots, violence, vandalism? Yes, yes, yes. Have I personally had countless conversations with Jesus-loving, protesting, anti-racist people who are appalled at violence and destruction? Of course, you have to. To paint them all with one big broad brush stroke is not the Jesus way. To get in and understand what's happening and the heart cry of oppressed people, that is the Jesus way. Don't dare, we dare not paint things like this with broad brush strokes. Let me, let me put it this way, this is the way I'd say it. The devil is pleased, I'm just gonna have it on the screen. The devil is pleased when we paint people and movements with broad strokes and write things off that Jesus is for because there appears to be evil mixed in. And write things off that Jesus is for because evil appears to be mixed in. Let me say this very clearly. I and Lakeside Church, we've talked about this before, and I just want to say again before I get to the application of this text with what's been happening, are for anti-racist movements. We are for protesting. And some of you are like, oh, Jesus people, should we really be for protesting? Shouldn't we just be peaceful and quiet? Just, just to be clear, if you're a Jesus person who's uncomfortable with the idea of speaking out when you see something that's wrong, that's literally what protesting is, you're not okay with your own Christian history. Because 500 years ago, the reformers saw horrible things happening in the church and they protested. And we literally, we follow them. We still look back on history and think that was a good thing. It's literally in our name. We're called Protestants. 
What's the base root of Protestants? Protest. It is part of our ethos and DNA. If we are okay what happened in history and look down on anyone else who speaks out when they see injustices, that is the height of religious hypocrisy. So we are for anti-racist movements. We are for protesting. But now let me make this clear. Let me land this. If you're looking for Jesus to justify destruction of property, looting, and violence, you will not find it here. And this is not the text. Jesus does none of those things in this story. First of all, we have this image from Hollywood of Jesus throwing tables and smashing things. You don't find it in the story. In fact, it says he turned over the tables. Didn't flip them, didn't throw them. He turned over the tables. Jesus also didn't take the money. He didn't rob them. He didn't loot them. He didn't take the money. It was easily picked up after. He didn't harm any people or animals. And it says, if you read the story carefully, the whip was used for the sheep and goats. That's what he was using because that's how you got them out. That's how you got crowds of animals to start moving was with a tool. Shepherds used tools. And by the way, they were easily round back up after. The animals were just out and they could easily be round back up. And then here's a little nerdy bit just to kind of see Jesus's posture. If you go to the book of John, when that account of the story happens, can I just read it for you? Because there's something here that I never noticed. It's so cool. John chapter two, verse 15. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and and cattle, wasn't whipping people. And look at this, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He overturned their tables. Nobody says he threw them. And then to those who sold doves, okay, we have this picture from Hollywood of Jesus rich, reaching into the, 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 the cages and kind of throwing these doves. And it's almost like Jesus is like, ha ha, good luck finding them. They're gone for good. Jesus is freeing the birds. Now look what Jesus says to the people with the doves. Get these out of here. The one animal that had the ability to fly away and never come back and those owners would lose their business. Jesus respects that. And he's like, you guys take these away. He doesn't rip the cages open and start throwing birds everywhere. He respects them. He respects the people. He respects their bodies. He respects their possessions, even while taking decisive action. And that's what I want us to understand from this, this picture. Jesus is taking decisive action. Jesus is not going into someone else's house and causing chaos. He literally says, this is my house. This is my father's house. Jesus has authority and he's clearing his own house. He's like, you guys don't have any authority here. He is dispersing people who do not have the right to be in his home, who are oppressing people that he came to love and to save and to make a way for them to encounter God. That's what Jesus is doing in this story. Not going into other people's homes and destroying their things. To which you say, okay, but then how do you explain, like, okay, he didn't throw the table, he didn't flip it, he just, he just turned the table. How do you explain the turning the table? Why didn't Jesus ask politely? Like, Jesus is so polite. He always invites people to, you know, make a decision. He doesn't force anyone. So why is he, he turning the tables? Like, what's going on there? So I want you to think about our kids' ministry. This is the best story I can, you know, think of to help you understand this, okay? Um, we love kids at Lakeside. It grieves us that we don't have our kids here every single week in this season, but we understand it, okay? But we love kids. And normally, when we have kids' program, we have amazing kids' volunteers. And because we love kids, our kids' director, Kim Wheeler, is very cautious about who she lets work with kids, right? Like, you don't just check a box and you're in, okay? Like, there are forms to fill out. There are police applications, like reference checks. Like, we do as much as we can to make sure our children are safe. Now, I want you to imagine that you find out that one day someone lets Kim know, hey, so-and-so, uh, who's actually with the kids right now, actually lied on their application process and got a fake police report and is actually has a history of harming children, okay? What do you think Kim's going to do? Do you think she's going to walk in there and be like, hi, hey, sorry, hey, we've just learned some new information and, and we're, we really don't think that's a good idea, that's unwise. And so we were wondering if maybe possibly somehow you would consider uh, leaving the room and, and not returning because we just don't think this is a good idea. To which the person might say, no, no, I, I really don't want to leave. To which Kim might say, oh, well, you know what? You know, we're Jesus people here and Jesus was always so gentle and he never forced anyone to do anything. And so you just let us know. You just let us know when you're ready to leave and we'll make sure that we see you out, but take your time. Jesus was never rushing people. We don't want to rush people. You think Kim's going to do that? No. Let me tell you what Kim's going to do. She's going to walk or maybe run into that room. She is going to physically remove the security tag that you have on that says that you are a safe person for those children. Then she's going to hand you your coat and invite you to leave and instruct you that if you don't, she will introduce you to Ed. Ed Ross, our volunteer security guard who may not look big, but moves appliances all day long and will be happy to move you too if you do not comply. 
That's what Kim's gonna do. Why? Because there's someone in our house endangering our most vulnerable. Jesus is not asking politely. Jesus is saying, this is my house and you're leaving. This business operation is done. Take your things and go. The animals are on their way out. You can go get them at the door. Jesus is taking clear, calm, calculated, decisive action against people who've made it their endeavor to oppress people, marginalize people, and he's having none of it. That is Jesus. That is our king, and I love him. Isn't that awesome? This is not a raging mad lunatic who just had one more strike and now he lost it. This is someone who is serious about what he came to do to help all people, all people, all people encounter God and to make it a safe and positive environment. And then here's the best part of the story. I've never noticed this. I always got caught up in the hype of Jesus throwing tables across the room. I never noticed the next verse, but it's so key, so key to the story. Look at this. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Wait, this is literally what happens after Jesus turns tables. The blind and the lame, I know it's not a politically correct term. This is written 2000 years ago. People who had trouble walking came to Jesus in this time. And when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts and they're not shouting, freaking out. They're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. The kids are literally singing after this event. Do you hear what these children are saying? The religious leaders said, yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Here's what happens. Jesus has this situation that we historically have thought of rage, anger, and violence, but now we know is not the case. And when you look at the aftermath, because often walking into the aftermath of an event, sometimes you walk into your house, you're like, oh dear, what just happened? All I heard was you're grounded and people stormed off and doors got slammed. But whatever happened in this, here's what we discover. Marginalized people draw near to Jesus, kids start singing, and religious power mongers are angry. Ask yourself, what do you think the tone of this event was? It's not what we've historically thought. So let's break down the response. Marginalized people draw near. As I said, we've all walked home and seen our siblings like, don't talk to dad right now. Don't talk to mom right now. Now's not a good time. What happens? Marginalized people who often were left out of the religious system who have physical uh, ailments see this as a time where they see what Jesus does and they say, this must be a safe time for us to go. We weren't sure, but now that we've seen what Jesus does, this is a safe time for us to approach him. What did they see in his posture? What do they see in his attitude? What do they see in his eyes that they felt like, here's a safe person. Here's a loving person. The kids start singing. And while that has prophetic significance, it's maybe a whole other message. Here's what we discover. When Jesus wields his power, he doesn't scare children. How many theological battles online or at family gatherings or on Facebook or at general meetings for the church? Have we thought, glad our kids didn't see that. Glad our kids weren't there for that one. And kids don't fake it. Kids know. Kids see the real deal and they start singing. And lastly, the religious leaders get angry and they seek to destroy the purifier instead of be purified themselves. Because remember, they were part of it. They allowed these criminals to take up office and there's a good chance they were skimming off the top as well. Here's the bottom line. Here's how I'd say it. When Jesus wields his power, When Jesus wields his power, the marginalized draw closer. When Jesus wields his power, the marginalized draw closer. Many of you, that hasn't been your experience of religious circles or religious people. Many of you, it has been. That's why you came to church. It wasn't a theology. It wasn't a book. It was a person in their love. But some of you, that wasn't your experience. You need to understand that that was not the Jesus way. Here's how I would summarize the entire text. Jesus is clashing with a religious system that has lost its purpose to help all people encounter God. Jesus is clashing with a religious system that has lost its purpose to help all people encounter God. So here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to just take some time and invite the band. Randy's gonna come up and play some piano. We're just gonna take some time and be still because it's one thing to just kind of read a story, be amazed by it, 
and then move on. It's another thing to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to the core of our being. And so I want to give some time for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to actually invite the Spirit of God to speak directly to us. And as I was preparing this week, I just got this clear sense from God. Like the reactions of these three different groups were really important for us to reflect on. And maybe actually to invite you to maybe resonate with one of the three groups and identify with them and their reaction. And to seek to see if there's anything that Jesus wants to say to us. So maybe this morning you're meant to just, you know, pause and reflect on the marginalized people who are drawing near. Maybe you personally had a bad church experience. Maybe it wasn't even the church. Maybe you didn't even grow up religious, but you experienced an abuse of power or struggle with authority. And so the whole idea of faith or this language of God being in control and just like control, power, king, like that just, that just, you just balk at it at the core of your being and you can't move forward. You just have maybe even felt like an outcast. You didn't even know your place. And yet you read the story and realize that people in similar situations who had been marginalized their entire lives felt like Jesus was a safe person to move towards. And maybe you just need to sit with that. Maybe the one you identify today is childlike discovery. And you're thinking, I'm, I'm not a child. I'm not close to child age. But maybe, maybe the Spirit of God is inviting you to just discover Jesus with that childlike innocence, to discover what he's really like. Those kids didn't watch the Jesus film. They didn't look at old art. They saw Jesus in the flesh. And when they saw the real Jesus, they sang. Maybe this is an invitation for you to begin exploring, to begin shedding some of the images that you got from popular culture or media or other people, but not the historical Jesus. And so maybe, maybe you just want to start reading the life story of Jesus. Maybe you want to read it with a highlighter and just highlight the parts that you know stand out to you. Highlight the parts that overwhelm you. Maybe you want to talk with someone, you know, We'll put that number back on the screen. Just text the word next. We'll be happy. One of our team members would love to reach out to you to give you information about Alpha or just even how to get a Bible or how to start engaging on your spiritual journey or your spiritual quest. We love helping people discover Jesus here at Lakeside. So maybe that's your next step. Maybe you identify with the religious people, the religious leaders. People look at you, and remember, when they looked at the religious leaders, they had the whole outfit on, and people assumed they had their stuff with God together. Maybe people look at you and assume that you have it all together. They assume that you are spiritual. But maybe if you're gut level honest, you're in love with a version of your faith, or you're in love with a system of faith. You know all the structures, you know all the answers, but in this season, you feel like you've just lost connection an encounter with your Savior, with your King Jesus. And maybe in the same way that Jesus was calling for decisive action, maybe today the Spirit of God wants to reveal to you something in your life, maybe to begin doing, maybe to stop doing, so that you can encounter Jesus afresh and in a new way today. So why don't we just pause? Give ourselves a few minutes just to ask, Holy Spirit, who are you inviting me to identify with today? How do you want to speak to me? And how are you inviting me to move forward? We'll be still now to hear from the Spirit. As I was reflecting on this passage, knowing we would be celebrating the Lord's table today, I found it beautifully ironic that we would be doing this on the day that we're reflecting on Jesus' cleansing of the temple, the day when Jesus flipped those tables of extortion, flipped those tables of religious oppression flip those tables that had become obstacles to people encountering God. And here Jesus sets a table. And by contrast, it's a table of invitation. At times throughout history, we have often made this table an obstacle to people coming to God. But Jesus set this table 2,000 years ago 
And he said, those who are hungry, come to me. I'm the bread of life. If you're thirsty, come to me and I will give you streams of living water and you will never thirst again. Are you weary? Come to me and I will give you rest. And here at this table, Jesus has set a table of encounter. And so I just invite you, if you're at home, to gather those things, the cookies, the bread, the crackers, the juice, if you haven't already done so. And for those of you here in the room, you would have received one of these that looked like a, a Keurig cup when you walked in. Uh, this is our COVID safe communion. Make no mistake, regardless, Jesus is present here at this table. This table is a place where heaven touches earth, and we get to be recipients of that. So as we eat and we drink these simple elements, we declare Jesus' victory over death, and we affirm our allegiance to Jesus as Lord and King, which in our culture is so countercultural, isn't it? We are captains of our own ships, thank you very much, masters of our own destiny. As Jesus followers, we are called to have Jesus as our King. And as we come to this table, we celebrate our place at this table. And you know what? There's room at this table. There's still many, many, many who need to be here today. And so as we celebrate communion this morning, we, we do so for the world, for others who are not yet at this table. There's a, a, a light film. If you're here in the room and you have one of these, there's a very thin film that I invite you to peel off. And under that film is your wafer. And I just marvel that regardless of the simple element we use, whether it's something the size of a dime or whether it's a loaf of bread, Jesus has promised to be here to meet us at this table. And so as we eat together, we, we do so remembering Christ's death. We do so in the unity of our calling, and we do so in celebration of our place at this table. So let's eat together. you to remove the second layer. You might want to face it away from yourselves. And you'll find the juice there. And again, as we drink together, we do so in remembrance of Christ's death, in the unity of our calling, and in celebration of our place at this table, Jesus' table. And we pledge our oneness together. So let's drink together in Jesus' name. Jesus, we thank you that you have stooped to meet us at this table with these very simple elements, regardless of what we have before us. You have chosen to meet us here. You set this table 2,000 years ago, and you said, come. Come if you're hungry. Come if you're thirsty. Come if you're weary. And so today we come, and we wait in expectancy for what you're going to do in us and through us and we thank you. Thank you for meeting us at this table. And Jesus, we pray that the next time we meet, there will be more at this table. That even now you are calling those friends of ours, those family members, those neighbors who just need an encounter with you. Thank you for your presence here with us today. In your mighty name. Amen. If you would like prayer today, I'll be there at the cross if you'd like to come and we will 
physically distance with our masks and I'd be happy to pray for you. There is a garbage at the back that you can drop these into on your way out. And just before you go, I just want to bless you uh, as you leave. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you. As you go forth this week, would you have courage to face those tables in your life that need flipping and invite Jesus to come and flip those tables. Might you have the confidence in knowing that Jesus is present in the midst of your fire. And so go in peace, friends. Go in peace until we meet again.